Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cloud Wars Live, the podcast where we dig into the digital revolution. What's happening there? New technologies coming in, industries changing, jobs changing, culture changing, our personal lives, everything up and down the line, upside down, inside out. And we're going to see, I think, pretty quickly, you know, where a lot of this is headed. And one of our favorite monthly guests, one of our digital all-stars, Tony Uphoff, is the CEO of Thomas. And he's got this terrific seat. Thomas is the creator of Thomas Net, which matches industrial and manufacturing buyers and sellers. They've got a massive database monitoring what these companies are doing, what they're looking for, what they're sourcing, what they're buying. And in so doing, gets a little bit of a peek into the future of what's happening. So Tony, after that wonderful buildup, I hope you're ready to you know, blow our socks off here. Let's, let's do this. And I just want to make sure just to be very, very clear based on some of the social media activity going on out there, please, if we get into the subject of service now, I don't want the service now trolls to come after me. It's Bob Evans <laughs> on Twitter. It's Bob Evans on LinkedIn. So I just, you know, I just want to be very clear about that up front, Mr. Evans. Well, I, I, I didn't want to pour you into this and thank you for giving me the <laughs> idea, the inspiration, but I won't even mention it. Very good. Very good. So CLO, for sure. Tony, though, uh, you know, it, it is wild here. The uh, how you said once this thing about the art of communication, right? That it's yeah. people have to hear something. What is it? Eight times before it generally gets inside their head. So how long is it going to be when, you know, people will hear there's a manufacturing, not just renaissance or an uplift, but a boom taking place here? Yeah, it, it is interesting, Bob, and, and you and I were talking just a little bit before we went on air today about this, and, and just to broaden the scope for your listeners, you know, the U.S. manufacturing industry is, is close to a $3 trillion industry, and as, as they say, there aren't that many of those walking around out there, right, you know, in terms of size and scope, and as I've shared many times, and, and I'm sure many of your listeners realize, the, the, the manufacturing industry is going through a remarkable digital transformation. So certainly on the factory floors, and we continue to see remarkable technologies there, but also now in, in, in across supply chains and related areas of, of manufacturing. And it's just, you know, really extraordinary to watch what's going on. Probably the biggest challenge that's happening in the industry right now is really a skill shortage, getting enough talented people inside these companies. And there's close to a million and a half jobs that are open today let alone, you know, what that's going to look like in 2025, 2030, you know, and, and, and on down the road. But it's funny, Bob, as you and I talked about this, and this is where culture meets strategy, where culture meets technology. As I talk to, to people that have been in the industry for a long time, let, let me call them folks that have been a part of the legacy of manufacturing. We all tend to look backwards and idealized, you know, the earlier stages of our lives and our careers and, and put rose-colored glasses on them. How many people that are in manufacturing and have been for the majority of their career are really struggling with, is the glass half empty or is it half full? And how do they want to look at this? And how do they see this really starting to lay out? Add to that that manufacturing, as is, is you and I have talked about before, has been used inappropriately as a bit of a political football of, you know, between crime and jobs going away to offshoring manufacturing. Those are the two stump speeches for every political candidate, regardless of your uh, of your party affiliation. So when you add all that up, you have this kind of legacy Eeyore kind of mentality. And, and what hit me, Bob, and, and I thought it just might be an interesting conversation for you and I to have. As we help the manufacturing industry understand the, the market opportunities that are available today, partly through the magic of these remarkable new technologies that are being introduced, a couple of fascinating dynamics are happening. A, there's a lot of new people coming in and new money coming into manufacturing, right? So on the new people side of things, there's an entrepreneurial nature of startups and manufacturing that we probably haven't seen in decades. And part of this is because the cheaper, faster, better nature of access to this technology is enabling people to come into this marketplace and small to medium-sized manufacturers are really booming right now. I think I shared with you, in New York City, there's over 8,000 small manufacturers that are generating over $7 billion a year in revenue. In New York City, 
These are not out in the rural plains somewhere. These are yeah. not in the, the, the you know, previous factory you know, zones that you and I would know. So I look at that side of it. I think the other side of it, Bob, this is kind of fascinating, is if, if I put a little bit of my historian's hat on in terms of the impact that technologies had in disrupting markets, if I'm honest, it's rarely an incumbent or a legacy company that disrupts the market. I could argue, is it ever said in another way as a question? And so I, I, um, I evangelize, if I can use that phrase here, to the manufacturing industry of, hey, the reason you're seeing so much venture capital come in, the reason you're seeing so, you know, entrepreneurial spirit is there's a massive, massive market opportunity here, but it's not just going to sit there. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it's, it's, I think, one of these very unique moments in time where I, I actually, and this isn't a bold prediction, Bob, but I would suggest that over the next five years, you're going to see some really, truly disruptive business models applied to manufacturing. Some are, are kind of whispers in the wind right now. Some are a little closer to reality. Some are actually gaining some traction. But I think you're going to see a wholesale level of um, positive technology disruption that's going to revolutionize manufacturing as we know it, which means some incumbents are going to adapt to that and be inspired by it and acquire their way and or uh, innovate their way. But, but I think you're also going to see some companies are going to struggle. And this is a cultural struggle, Bob, that I'm identifying. It's not a, a, a lack of uh, intelligence or a lack of access to information. Yeah, Tony, that, that, that uh, never ending tension between culture and strategy, right? And the, the capability of that difficult at any point to try to find the right balance with those. But, you know, in these times when things are happening just so fast, and uh, Tony, I've started to see more and more, like in the tech world, I think there should be more of this, but there's a beginning of it where a lot of the big tech companies are starting to understand that the, the value proposition they have to impart to their customers is speed. Right, yeah. we can help you move faster, understand yeah. faster, build faster, innovate faster, and so on like that. Because nobody, we've never seen anything like this. So in the manufacturing sector, right, and it's it's partly cultural, as you said, it's partly that self fulfilling things, right? You hear enough supposedly smart people, knowledgeable people say, "Well, there's a dead end thing." Blah blah. You know, it start to believe it. But three trillion dollars, as you said, there's not a lot of those characters walking around. And I don't think people are going to stop wanting, uh, you know, to invest in things, to buy things, to look at things. I think it's going the other way, right? With this capability for you to have any sort of shoe you want, any sort of car you want, any sort of, you know, appliances, devices, uh, you know, these, these new custom things that are happening, homes and the way those are being built. Tony, it, and the smart buildings, different sorts of buildings that can adapt. It, it's... It's just astonishing. Are you optimistic about the opportunity for a cultural uh, awakening here? I am. I, I really am because I think you know. Oftentimes, and and again, I, I hate to sound like you know Obi Wan Kenobi here or some ancient kind of you know p person who bridges these these time horizons. But if if I look back. And, and look at where these breakthroughs happened in other markets that I was, was uh, fortunate enough to be, have a ringside seat to watch kind of as this level of transformation started to happen. Oftentimes the, the, the kind of, I'll call it naysaying for lack of a better term, the kind of, yeah, but, well, yeah, that, that's, that's not really happening the way you think it is, is the, the kind of last gasps of anxiety or energy letting go. You know, it's 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 actually not as much of a barrier because if you look back at it, it really is just people released, you know, what they're really trying to say is, man, I, I hope you're right. Yeah. I, I hope you're right. I hope there's really some growth in this market. You know, I hope there's some new inspiration in this marketplace. I hope there's some, you know, you and I've seen this time and again in different marketplaces out there. You know, if I if I look at um, financial services. You know, if you if you went back into the 1980s or even to the early 1990s and you talked to people that worked on Wall Street or worked involved in, in finance, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a racket, it's a scam, it's a bunch of nonsense. Books, movies were written about that. And in came this thing called FinTech. And by the way, none of the Wall Street guys, or I shouldn't say none, but few of the Wall Street guys were really a part of that. And in came FinTech and those folks just looked at it and said, boy, here's a massive market with asymmetric you know, information exchange. We, gee, we can fix that. Yeah. Right. And, and I think it's a similar dynamic. It doesn't mean that the, these people will go away. It doesn't mean that these companies are going to fail. But the optimist in me feels a little bit like I've kind of seen this movie before a little bit because people don't, you know, we're, we want to be careful. We're not seeing a mirage. We want to be careful. We're not seeing something that's not there. I think the other thing that's connected here, Bob, and I would compare it to the, the, the financial uh, technology revolution there wasn't a lot of data. And, and you know, it, it's, it's really hard to wrap your arms around the manufacturing industry. The data is, is scarce. What data there is, as I referenced before, is oftentimes misused or misaligned. I've shared before the, um, the, what's called the, the PMI index that's put out by the Trade Association, ISM, is a sentiment survey of 300 people. Mm -hmm that they attempt to uplift to a $3 trillion industry, which, you know, call me crazy. Um, I know enough about uh, economics and mathematics to know that's actually impossible statistically. And so I think this is an industry not unlike finance probably was there that was a little parochial, misunderstood by the average person, you know, preyed at some level on the idea of, of these information asymmetries so that, you know, they could, they could kind of get the best out of it. And, and I think as it becomes more transparent, as it becomes more clear, I, th I think you're, you're going to see just, you know, a, a remarkable opportunity for incumbents as well as new, um, you know, companies that are, that are getting into the mix. Yeah. And Tony, I want to ask about that and uh, push this maybe in a couple different directions. One is that, you know, as, as you call it with Thomas and the, the unique, data services and properties that your company offers about that. But then you've also got the industrial and manufacturing markets, right? Those, the, the boundaries sort of confining or defining those industries are changing, right? So where does it start to move out into uh, materials management and, you know, co-creation of design and product lifecycle management? So it, again, it isn't just this static thing of like, you know, you were saying the good old days, like, uh, was it Ford with the River Rouge plant uh, in yep. Detroit, right? A mile long, raw material comes in here and a car comes out the other end. This is something wildly different, uh, highly dynamic, global in nature, uh, enhanced at every step of the process by technology. And I think most important that the customers are moving in and being, you know, pulled deep, more deeply into the process than ever before. It's, it's a very, very different world. Well, and if you think about how many different markets, Bob, have we watched go through a similar paradigm shift where it was a linear model, mm -hmm. you know, raw materials, your, you know, visualize your, your, your river ex example or your Ford example, pardon me. And, and we then looking back saw platform models that came in and allowed for co-creation, allowed for customer data and other things to co-create value and start a completely different look at the business. And, you know, if you want, if you, you know, look at from Uber to Airbnb to Facebook to other, other platform businesses, certainly that's what happened in those markets. You know, in, in any publisher's wildest dreams, if you had gone back pre probably 2010 uh, and said, hey, there's a company, it's called Facebook, your kids are probably on it, and it's going to step in between you and your audience and you and your advertisers, and it will control your destiny going forward. They would have said, no, 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 you're talking about Google. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know from Facebook, that doesn't make any sense. And then we woke up and realized, oh my God, Facebook is controlling what publishers do or don't do, particularly in consumer media and, and the like. And I, I think you've got a similar paradigm that's starting to happen here, that idea of co-creation of value and about leveraging data at higher and higher levels. And there are some examples in manufacturing of platform companies. Siemens is doing some fascinating things. The auto, auto industry, Bob, is just ablaze with innovation right now. And it doesn't mean every auto company is doing you know, extraordinarily well, but when you look at the discrepancy in valuations, 
you know, Tesla's what $900 billion valuation or some extraordinary level, which is the, the valuation of the next top five car companies rolled up. And you look at that, but you actually look at the innovation that, that those other car companies are doing. And perhaps you could argue that innovation is not quite yet at the level of what Tesla is doing with electric vehicles, but the discrepancy there is too big. The innovation of what these car companies are doing right now is just mind bending. And talk about co-creation, co-creation with other suppliers, co-creation with other manufacturers, co-creation with customers. And it seems kind of amazing to say, well, a car company could become a platform company. You bet. You know, General Electric went through a few stumbles and transitioned to management primarily because they had a, a big pig in the python, as demographers call them, in the financial services industry that was spinning off a lot of profits, but they knew at the end of the day was going to be problematic for the company. As they write the ship there and get back to what they really understand, they're doing some remarkable stuff and creating kind of platform businesses in and around the manufacturing industry that are really impressive. Yeah, so it is truly, Tony, like a, a wild time. Uh, so that's happening, right? The, the co-creation on the one end, and then there's uh, what you've described here. Um, I think Tony had a great term about the, this, not just a reimagination, but a, a whole new generation of people maybe getting into heavy industry manufacturing and re-embracing, as you called it, this notion of creating and building things. It's, it's, yeah. That too is gonna drive uh, unimaginable changes. Yeah, and you know, Bob, you and I've touched on this a little bit before. I, I was kind of fascinated when I first joined Thomas and got access to the data. I really thought of the users of thomasnet.com. I'd see a mature industry in procurement engineering and what are called MROs, people on maintenance, repair and operations inside a factory, right? And, and I, I found that, but I also found a, a wildly broad demographic stretch and a tremendous number of millennials that were very active in all aspects of the marketplace. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know, and, and I guess coming from the outside and I didn't anticipate, obviously all industries need new talent and, and manufacturing is no different. But I, I was kind of amazed at the number of millennials that were flooding into the marketplace in all of those functional areas from the, let's call it the buy side, procurement and engineering, to the supplier side, the, the, the actual manufacturers or custom manufacturers that fuel so much of the industry. So I started to do some study on this and I came across um, a series of studies. All the major consultancies have been doing demographic studies and cultural studies on the shifting age demographics in the workforce. And as of 2017, we hit a really interesting inflection point where the number of millennial managers were in the workforce at, and of the same size as baby boom managers. We'd never actually had this happen, right? right. So the baby boom generation, largest generation ever created, obviously the, the demographic the most studied, now had a generation of its equal size in the workforce at the same time. So I think several things were, were, were starting to happen as I started to look at those studies. Going back to your kind of core point, one of the things that the studies showed is that the millennial generation was exhibiting some dissatisfaction with knowledge work. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, you know, this isn't a pendulum swing, you know, all knowledge work, no knowledge work, right. but they were starting to see statistically um, relevant numbers where millennial uh, people in the workforce were, were basically saying, hey, knowledge work isn't that fulfilling for me. And there was an example of a quote from somebody that I absolutely loved. And it's like, yeah, you know, I'm riding the subway home to my apartment and I turn to the person next to me and say, you should look at the spreadsheet I built today. It is <laughs> unbelievable. This, there's never been a spreadsheet like this. It could make you weep in this beauty versus, hey, what do you do? Hey, you know what? I, I make this. See this cool looking pen? I actually work for the company that makes these, right? And so I, I think as you start to, to explore that, and certainly the research did, we think we're starting to see this in some of the numbers. A, there's a lot of millennials that are entering in, broadly speaking, to the industrial or manufacturing ecosystem. There's a lot of small business startup from young people and things like that that we're witnessing. But the more I started to study this, Bob, the more I kind of related it to broader societal trends that are happening out there. You're familiar with the maker movement. 
yeah. which has really accelerated over the last decade or so and, and almost kind of a return to being able to make and build things. Um, you're seeing a remarkable amount of stuff in popular media. So I, I'm going to read off a few shows here. There's very, very popular cable or streaming shows, uh, Battle Bots, How It's Made, Mythbusters, Forged in Fire, Blown Away, and there's a kind of a rock star in the area, a guy named Mark Rober. And all of these shows are really about building and making things. And they have a kind of a, a manufacturing subtext. So it, it's, I, I don't know if I'm identifying you know, a cultural shift or, or, or different dynamic. I would assume if we went back and studied, Bob, every generation kind of you know, ha has a return. You know, the organic movement has, has a similar thread to it, that every generation probably has that Hey, you know, you know, it, uh, enough, enough with the, uh, uh, you know, the the knowledge work and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Perhaps it's time to to build something or leave something of legacy. So there's probably some of that at foot, but I think this is happening at a time, Bob, where the the technology that's available, the enabling technologies, plural, right, is is really unique. Had this been 50 years ago, the same thing probably happened. But the enabling technologies didn't allow someone like me to say, well, gosh, I could, I could get a hold of an you know, additive manufacturing machine. Mm -hmm. I could hire a designer and an engineer. I could probably figure out how to do that. 50 years ago, you wouldn't even have had that conversation because it would have required a, a, such a massive investment to get in you know, the old fab model. Yeah. Gee, I'd like to get in the semiconductor industry. I just don't happen to have a billion dollars to build a fab. <laughs> Hiker. Uh, no. Um, yeah. Let yeah. me take uh, Tony just a second here. I want to share a word from our sponsor, BMC. BMC wants to know, is your business on its A game? That's when systems are intelligent by learning from markets, where automation is paramount yet effortless, when technology and people work as one in an enterprise. The A game is your business at its absolute best. BMC calls this the autonomous digital enterprise. Find out more at bmc.com slash A game. Well, Tony, you know, on those uh, on that point there, uh, I, I do think it's really extraordinary some of these things coming up, and I buy in completely to your whole premise about the the boom that isn't coming that is here in industrial and manufacturing. But when you, in the cult, uh, the context of the cultural dynamics that you've been talking about, I do think it's fascinating that you know some of those terms in there like. Uh, you know, the uh, maker movement, the builder movement, they're not calling it necessarily the manufacturing movement, right? It's like, what can I do? How do I make this a little smarter, simpler, faster that I don't need the billion, $2 billion, $5 billion for a fab plan or, you know, whatever it might be. So it's almost like uh, it's become a, a sub-segment or um, some people might say, no, it's not manufacturing at all. This is something different. And I go back yeah. to... I think it was three or four years ago, uh, Amazon had those series of ads uh, about AWS, you know, the builders. We're aimed at the building, yeah. you know, and that was really a big thing in there, this, uh, the power of an individual to create things that was never possible before. Yeah, you know, it, it is a really interesting point, Bob, and I have labored since being involved in it of, of really unpacking all that manufacturing is today. And I, I agree with your thesis that I think to an extent, it's a limiting point based on, on the, the totality of what we see as an industry. You know, I oftentimes have used as an example with people of, you know, where, where they'll, they'll, they'll talk about manufacturing and yeah, well, it's this, it's that. I said, well, you know, what do you think Apple is? Yeah. Apple's a menu. So let's go to the most valuable company on the face of the earth. They're a manufacturer. Hey, how uh -huh. about number two? Hey, how about number three? Yeah. You climb up underneath them and they're, they're, they're fundamentally builders. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, there, there's a, I think, um, I don't know if we need an all encompassing term or we just need a more enlightened view, but I, I think you're onto it. And I think that term of builders really does start to reflect something you know we're we're the only species yet identified and studied that actually has a curiosity for wanting to imagine and then in turn build things that didn't exist mm -hmm. and it, it is the defining nature of human beings 
That's the, the only thing we found for sure that is, is, you know, unique to human beings. And I think that is, is innate. And, and I think it's, it's uh, inevitable, but I do agree with you. I think we are, we are finding now that the, some of these terms, you know, if I go back years ago, when I was graduating school, you know, people, you, you had finance majors, maybe you had econ majors, but mostly it was, well, you know, I, I, I'm an accounting major. Mm -hmm. And boy, I, I know even really great, tremendous friends of mine who, you know, run accounting services and all that kind of stuff. They didn't want to be accounting majors. There, were, there, <laughs> there was no sex yeah. appeal to it. But, you know, when you started to think in terms of finance, yeah. you know, I think, I think well, yeah, I, I'm in finance. You know, my, my individual discipline might be accounting, Right. Or or yeah. something like that. But, you know, I, I, I aspire to use financial tools to help build and grow businesses. That's what I want. That's why I studied this stuff. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I don't wake up every day, you know, defining myself as I count the beans and that's yeah. how I do it. And therefore, I'm an accountant. So yeah. I'm struggling for the right metaphor here. Right. Or comparison, Bob. But I, I think you're on to something as usual. There's an opportunity here, I think, for the manufacturing industry to to um you know may, maybe it's it's uh, the manufacturing industry's got milk moment yeah. Yeah. of uh redefining how we explain yeah. what this is and and having a, a time where people go oh yeah okay yeah that that whole thing uh oh gosh i'm i'm blanking out here a little bit on something tony but um Oh, uh, ServiceNow, um, on, on their earnings call recently, they're, one of the new categories that they're going after uh, is what they call creators. So yeah. I don't think they mean sculptors. I don't think they mean, uh, you know, painters. We're talking about developers, but they've yeah. sort of taken that thing up. Now, the more modern parlance, right? The, the old idea of programmers sitting in a, you know, vast room, you know, hammering away. At something, but now this thing of the creators coming up, the creative class, the creative economy, the builders, the makers. I, I do think there's something pretty broad going on there. But Tony, I wanted to challenge you a little bit about the thing about you know that uh, Homo sapiens is the only species that that builds and creates. What about the otter who gets a uh, a shellfish, and floats on his back, and gets a rock and cracks it? You know, that is a remarkable use of tools. Now, what, what, what is unclear is whether the otter imagined using that tool to build something that didn't already exist. So the otter didn't build the shellfish. <laughs> the, the otter discovered the shellfish and then discovered a way to open. Now, again, I, I don't want to match wits with an otter because I think they're really intelligent creatures. And, and frankly, I think they could be mean little suckers too if they got a hold of you. So I don't want to challenge the uh, the otter there, but uh, yeah, you uh, could be swimming somewhere, and otter grabs you, and it's got your head instead of that shellfish, a little with that rock. I'll like, tell you, you're the guy. I saw that podcast. You were bad mouthing otters. Well, and imagine how embarrassing it would be. You know, you're you're in the emergency room, and you know you, they're getting you a bandage. Yeah, what, what, hey fellow, what happened? Well, an otter got me. Excuse me. Yeah, otter, otter tipped me over backwards and smacked my head with a rock thinking I was a shell. All things are possible, Professor. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't hold it back. And, you know, I, will insurance pay for that? You know, well, we don't have anything, you know, kidnapped by an otter. I do have an otter clause, but it was a, it was a rider that was quite expensive. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Bob, in my insurance. Well, there too, the, the creative uh, movement in the insurance policy, Tony. Hey, yeah. um, Tony, this has been, as always, terrific. I love what's going on there. And I got to think about that thing of 8,000 manufacturing companies in New York City, $7 billion in revenue. So, right, what's that average out to? You know, about 900,000 bucks a year annual per person. So it, it, it gives us yeah, these. Yeah, think about it, Bob. These are small companies, right? But what what is, you know, as you and I have talked about before, the the this is a story of, of, a, of a tech, you know, enabling technology. It really is because you can't go out and just say, gosh, I, I now want to be a creator. 
you know, technological change is preceding this cultural change. The reason that ServiceNow and other companies are going after the creator economy is it's easier, not easy. I want to be really clear. It's yeah. easier to be a creator than it's ever been. The, 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 the discipline, the, the, um, the willingness to strive, the creative education you have to go through to do it, that's not changed. But what has changed is the enabling technologies, you know, within, within reach or grasp of so many more people today. And I, I think that's, you know, we, we, we tend to think of that, well, gee, that makes sense in the quote unquote digital creator economy. You, you know, you, you and I are exhibiting it right now. You know, this podcast didn't exist several years ago. You created this, you created that and it's all over the digital airwaves. And that's a great example of that. I think what you and I are describing is today, similar types of technologies are available to us where we can source materials, yeah. right? Source manufacturing uh, machines and equipment and even inside a big bustling city like New York City. And it is really remarkable as we've done, we have a, a very tight relationship with an organization called ITAC that within New York City provides services to local manufacturers. And I know when they first contacted me, I was like, Ser services for local manufacturers in New York City? And uh, bagel it, makers, right? I, and I learned so much. And they are making every, you know, certainly stuff like garments and things like that are in there, but they're making everything up and through and including, you know, uh, medical equipment and all <laughs> kinds of different things. Um, but I think, Bob, it really, there's a, a as usual, you've, you've nailed a thread here that, that brings it all together. I think this creator economy, the builder economy, is I think what we're now able to do is we're really combining the digital and the physical in ways that, you know, was sort of almost science fiction if you go back 30 or 40 years ago. Today, it's a reality. The idea that we can print on demand a product yeah. is just, you know, I still, I just, you know, I know 3D printing is not yeah. new, but every time I see it or see another application, I just marvel at the power of that and what it's, uh, what it's doing. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe 10 years from now, Bob, you'll see just a, a, an enormous vibrancy to small manufacturers. You know, today they're more small to medium. You know, even in the scheme of things, a company is generating a million dollars a year. You know, while that's a still a very small company, you know, if there's only five to 10 people in that company, they can be making a nice living in that and, yeah. you know, doing quite well for themselves. You know, uh, uh, imagine as that starts to expand where, you know, people in some cases, these could be side gigs for people that just, you know, want to express themselves and develop an expertise in, in some small areas of manufacturing. And, you know, we could see a, a, a real blossoming of small to medium sized business, particularly here in the US. What, one other thing I would add to this, Bob, your listeners may be hearing about or reading about something called the Buy American Act as though this was a new concept. It's not, it's been around for the better part of 70 or 80 years. Unfortunately, it's not been administrated. So the, the latest news is really very similar to a tax code that got updated and the uh -huh. loopholes the loopholes stripped out. So what's happened now is the Buy American Act has had the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the loopholes taken out of it. And what it is now gonna be is that if you're doing business with the government, we spend $600 billion a year, most of it in manufactured products and services, have to be from American companies. So the trickle down effect, Bob, you know, as a, as a top manufacturer, you know where all your, your stuff, but as you sub parts of it out, yeah. the, the visibility on, on the, the components can, can get a little, a little fuzzy for you. So now what's, what's happening is each of those small to medium manufacturers here in the United States are going to have an unfair advantage now to step up into that business. And so long way of coming back to my core point, I, I took a bit of a, a long loop there, um, is in addition to the enabling technologies that create entrepreneurialism and a lot of new startups and, and new vibrancy in manufacturing, I think some of the regulatory trends, particularly here in the United States, are in the favor of some of those small to medium size, which just adds an, a little bit more fuel to the fire, if you will. Great, Tony, Tony, that's good to hear, good to hear. Well, um, Professor Upoff, great stuff today. Thanks, really exciting. And uh, you know, 
at, at a time when it seems like everything is new. I, we got to keep pounding that drum here too, that uh, that does not exclude industrial manufacturing, makers, builders, creators, and all that. In fact, it's, you know, get in on this. And as you said, uh, it's certainly catching the attention of venture capitalists and private equity firms. So those companies in those businesses have, have a clear choice, right? And there, there's lots of things going on, but I hope Tony will be able to come back to this. And uh, as always, thanks a million for some fascinating insights. Hey, Bob, always enjoy our conversations. Thanks for having us on. Very good. Folks, thanks to all of you for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live. Two weeks left in the summertime. Enjoy the heck out of them. We hope we'll see you again soon. So long.